still don't have a very strong voice, uh, much better than it was, but I can't talk over the top of you, so. <clears throat> and I haven't probably done this much uh, talking in one section for a while, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Um, I have missed everyone, and uh, um, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, and I feel very discombobulated because I'm out of my um, rhythm, sort of uh, teaching and, and studying and preparing. And so uh, we'll see how it goes. I actually have two lessons. Uh, I but I am picking the one that. I actually put together at 5.30 this morning <laughs> because it just occurred, it came to me. Actually, I was going to get up at 6.30 to review the notes on the one I had made before, which I was really not that happy with, and then I realized it wasn't 6.30, it was 5.20 or something of the hour. <laughs> so I just stayed up and um, <coughs> went with that. <clears throat> So uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and then I'll, I'll show you what I have for us today. The, I, we're going to be looking at these scriptures. We're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures that when you see these, you may think, well, they don't. what do they have to do with Galatians chapter 3? But hopefully, as we go through them, you will uh, you'll see. So let's open with uh, prayer, and we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to be back with the ladies again and to uh, have the privilege of um, presenting your word um, to them and um, trying to uh, craft a lesson that might help us better understand uh, the teaching of your word and, and our faith and our justification and all the blessings that you give us in our Lord Jesus Christ. And, I just pray that you would help us this morning, help me, that my thoughts uh, are uh, flowing freely, that the Spirit uh, will guide them, and that you, Holy Spirit, would give Christ all the glory uh, in this time that we spend together. Edify our souls, um, help us to um, love our Lord Jesus more deeply as we see him more clearly in the sacred scriptures, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. First scripture I want to look at is Second uh, Peter three fourteen through eighteen, and I'm just going to I'm only going to comment on a few of these, and then I'll spend more more time in John and Luke. Uh, but in Second Peter three fourteen eighteen. In the final epistle of Peter, the, the epistle, his final letter that was written uh, most likely a year, year and a half before he was martyred, probably written in AD, between AD 65 and 67, gives his final words to the Jews in the dispersion, but they apply to us as well, and they certainly apply to our lesson. Let me read them quickly in your hearing. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, talking about the things that were coming before the promise, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them, that is in Paul's writings, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And I think Peter, um, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit now, says um, to these readers and to us something that we've probably already found to be quite true as we study the book of Galatians, 
that there are things in Paul's writings that are hard to understand. But also these things that the ignorant and the wicked twist to their own destruction. They twist the words of God in order to fit their own little um, um, structure of theology. And that is what we see going on in the uh, book of Galatians, as other places in the scripture, uh, that Paul is seeking to set straight. One old writer said some of the things that Paul writes, um, we have to handle um, as a dog would a hedgehog. Um, you just don't know what to do with it. You, know, you don't know whether to touch it and get poked or to push it away or to hug it near or, you know, and uh, it's true. Uh, there are difficult things in his writings. Nevertheless, they are there for our edification and we should continue to strive to understand them as best we can. Um, what we can't, we leave unto God to reveal to us if he wills in his own time and in his own way. But these Galatian believers, as we've studied thus far, were, were seemingly getting on well enough in their Christian lives and in their worship. Uh, they were progressing, though slowly, uh, in their walk with the Lord. And I know this because in Galatians 5, which we haven't gotten to yet, I know, but we will. You should have read the whole letter, and you should go back and read it occasionally as we work through it. But he says in verse 7, you were running well. He says this to these Galatians. You were running well. That has the idea of they were running the race that Hebrews talks about. They were looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith as they were running, um, seeking to attain the goal of Christ and eternal life as they ran. So they were doing fairly well, he said. But then his next question, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So even though we're in chapter 3, we can be reminded that in the first two chapters, Paul speaks about the ones that are troubling. You know, my friend, the ones that are, uh, that are troubling the Galatians by bringing in the law and by trying to put them back under a yoke of slavery to the law, the uh, ceremonial law, as well as the civil and other aspects of the law, saying you must obey the law in order to be right with God. And Paul says, you were running well, and now you're being hindered, and someone is troubling you. And he's very, very disturbed about that. Keep in mind, and he will say it elsewhere, that going back into Judaism, into this, the cultus, as we call it, of Judaism, with the, with the sacrifices and the, the circumcision and the dietary laws and the restrictions, was not in the mind of Paul, and therefore not in the mind of the Lord Jesus, it was not a step forward. It was not running well. It was not progressing. In fact, by going back to these elementary principles of food laws and days, and, and um, he calls them days and, and special um, um, seasons and all of this, he refers them uh, we'll see later as going backwards, as regressing, as not becoming grown-ups in Christ, but as becoming children again, babies, having to relearn all of this. Whereas the Judaizers thought this is the ultimate progressing in these things makes you superior to Christians, whereas that is not the view of Scripture. But when these Judaizers came in, and when any troublers come in and try to add to the gospel, they bring condemnation on themselves uh, and possibly on those that hear if they're not rooted and grounded in the word of God. Paul is battling this, and he's still discussing justification by faith. But I want us to labor a little bit 
on the latter part of chapter three, not so much going through it, but I want to pose a couple of questions um, that I think might, we might do well to look at uh, and maybe consider from the other passages that I have here. And the idea kind of came to me as I listened to Jan's teaching that Joy uh, so graciously posted on the covenants that she did last week, which was very good. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, why was it that the Judaizers trotted out Abraham and trotted out circumcision to these um, Galatian believers? Why do you think they did that? Um, and the fact that they did, uh, Paul did not ignore, nor did he dismiss, nor did he neglect to address. He took it head on. But I want to look at some other passages as well to show that this was nothing new. And then maybe we can get a little context as to why Abraham, why Moses, why did they trot these people out um, before them and parade them in their history before the Galatians? Why did they do that? But go with me then as we kind of explore this, and hopefully it will come clear as we go through. Let's look at John 8. And so we're going back into Jesus' ministry in John chapter 8 as he's teaching in the temple. And he, as he teaches, has Abraham paraded out in front of him um, as to be in opposition of what Jesus is saying. So I'm going to read some verses. Now, I'm only going to point out a few things in them. I'm not doing a whole study on these passages. I'm just showing you that what the Judaizers were doing to the Galatians, maybe 15 or, or more years, 18 years, 19 years after Christ's ascension, was, was going on when Jesus was here in his ministry, doing his ministry as well. So um, Jesus, we know, was in the verse 20 of chapter 8. Was the Pharisees were confronting him in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And he talks about his death and when he's lifted up. And as he did so in verse 30... The scripture says, and as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So many of the Jews believed in him, but there were many who did not. But in verse 31, he addresses those who believed. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him. Now this could be the Jews who had just now said that they believed, or it could be the Pharisees who were always lurking about and butting into the conversations in order to sway it their way. They answered him. And because of the, the vitriol of it, I think it was probably the Pharisees who, who said this. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham. See, they trot out Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, doesn't Paul mention the Jews talking about the offspring of Abraham? And Paul goes into it more and he explains in Galatians who are truly the offspring of Abraham. It's the spiritual offspring. It's not the physical descendants. But these Jews here... And in Galatians and in other places, we're hanging on to the idea of 
Abraham, in their minds, as they had been taught history, um, and as they had interpreted and rewritten in their minds and hearts history, because their hearts were wicked, they saw him as the first Jew, and they saw his circumcision as a mark that separated them from other peoples of the earth and set them apart. They conveniently neglect his believing in the Lord, which came first, if you go back to Genesis and those passages in Genesis um, 12 and Genesis 15, which our workbook covers. And also he was so important because he was the father of the patriarchs, of Isaac, of Jacob, and of the 12 tribes. And, and to Abraham was given the promise of the land. And you see, so all of their identity, all of their identity was focused in on Abraham. And they, they couldn't get past this. We are Abraham's offspring. Now notice what Jesus said, and I've never been enslaved, which was a ridiculous comment because their ancestors were enslaved in Egypt. They were enslaved by the Assyrians. They were enslaved by the Babylonians, and they are partially enslaved by the Romans now, although they have some liberties. Jesus answered them, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Now, this same principle of the idea of the slave and the son and being in the house and being the heirs, is also coming up in this next chapter in Galatians. Paul is drawing from Jesus' teaching, as Jesus taught him, about the same thing that Jesus is teaching to them now. So the language should be familiar to you. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, he said, and he meant by physical descent. Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Now, in Galatians, when Paul is going to be talking about we are all sons of Abraham through faith and offspring of Abraham and calls us sons of God, he's talking about the son, and daughters are included in this, taking on the resemblance of their who, whoever is their father. And so Jesus is saying, if Abraham was your father, you would be acting like Abraham in your spirit and in your ways towards me and towards God. And you, though, are doing the work of your father. And he's getting ready to tell them who their father is. But you can see these things that are going on. And the problem with the Judaizers is exactly the problem that Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees. My word has no place in you. You don't believe it. You don't accept it. You don't bow down to it. You don't submit to it. You don't love it. You love what you think you know. Which is what happened in the Old Testament and what had been passed down to you. And you twist it and are twisting it to your destruction and to the destruction of these Galatians. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, now here it is, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. The same is true for us. If we are children of God in Christ, we will be doing the works that our father does. Same kind of thing. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. They were accusing him of being an illegitimate 
person, born out of wedlock, if you will. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. They not only don't understand it, but they can't bear it. They hate it. Those that are not in Christ, I don't care what they say, at the root of them, they hate God and they hate his word and they hate Jesus. They don't love him. They don't submit to his word. His word has no place in them. Now he hits them in verse 44. You are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? And they could not. If I tell the truth, why do you not believe? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And then the Jews continued to rail on him and if they couldn't call him um, a bastard, basically, and you know, uh, illegitimate, then they call him a Samaritan, which was probably almost worse, and in their minds, and having a demon. I do not have a demon. I honor my father. You dishonor me. Let's jump down to verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died. Trotting out Abraham again. As did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? What would be the answer to that question? Yes. Jesus didn't address it directly. Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Jump down to verse 56. Your Father, now Jesus is not contradicting himself. He's saying your Father, by physical descent, if you want to say that, your Father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it. And was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? (laughs) Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. When you go back to Galatians, when we talk about Abraham believing God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Then you go all the way back into Genesis, and you see where it says Abraham believed God when God said, you'll have the land, and your offspring is as many as the stars in the sky, if you could count them. Abraham was looking forward to the coming of one who would be the Messiah. He didn't understand it, as Jan said last week, fully. It was in seed form, but he believed God's promise, even though he had no descendants just yet. He believed God, and he rejoiced in that, that he would see that day, and he was glad. And so when God says in in, um, uh, Genesis, and as he says it in Um, Galatians in the second chapter that Adam believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Basically he's saying I now consider Abraham a believer. I credit to his to his account his belief in my word. He is a believer. And he is blessed by believing. And so are all those who believe like Abraham. And of course it ended here that they picked up stones to throw at him because he basically identified himself as God by saying before Abraham was, I am. I pre-existed Abraham um, 
and I had no beginning, is what he's saying, and he, they, they would know this. They would know that the I am refers to the name of God from Exodus chapter 3, I am that I am. And so for a time, they left him alone, and then they, in the next chapter, they go after one of his poor little followers who just began to believe in him. But you see, what they were doing there is nothing really much different than what they're doing in Galatians. Now go with me to Luke. You might find this strange, but we think there are some interesting connections. So Paul was prepared for these arguments. They had been given by the Lord. The Lord had endured them. And I'm sure the Lord shared with Paul when he had that time with him and things were revealed to him that these were the case. And you're going to face some of these same things. I want you to look at a parable that Jesus taught that you are most likely familiar with. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Why is she trotting that out? That's my word of the day, trotting it out. Why is she trotting out this parable? There was a rich man, verse 19. Jesus is telling this parable who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Some versions might say into Abraham's bosom. Now Jesus is doing this deliberately because of who is listening to him. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, which is the New Testament idea of the place for the dead, place of torment. In Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw who? Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, Father Abraham, he saw Abraham as his father, to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said to him, or he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, why do I bring that parable up? And I think Jesus brought it up for several reasons, but one of the reasons is the shock that would come to those who heard a child of Abraham in hell. Can it be banished from the presence of Father Abraham, which in this parable Jesus meant to represent heavenly bliss and glory? But he used this specifically because of the audience to whom he was speaking would place such high value on Abraham. I don't believe that when I die, I'm going to go into Abraham, particularly his bosom or by his side. I believe he'll be there in heaven, but I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. But you see, Jesus was trying to show something because they didn't believe that if you were a a a child of Abraham, which they believe came from physical descent, and by keeping the law and doing the, the, the things that they were supposed to do, that they could possibly end up in any place, but in whatever place, and they didn't understand heaven the way we do and so on, and maybe not even understand heaven, 
but they would be in the presence of Abraham and what could be greater. And then it would be Isaac, and then it would be Jacob, and then it would be the 12 patriarchs, and then it would be all of their history and all of their loved ones, and the Jews would be all there, and the poor Gentiles like Lazarus, he should be down there. And Jesus is making this point. And this poor, lost person who's in hell, in torment, is still clinging to Abraham. And Abraham says, no, not me. It's not me. They, basically, he's saying, they have their Bibles. They have the word of God. That time with Moses and the prophets. If they don't hear, that means if they don't hear with believing ears, Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from this from the dead. This is why even Jews, Jesus is saying, must be born again. While they, why they need also to be justified by grace through faith. And I thought this was a very interesting thing. And then Abraham, according to this parable, which is a story that Jesus is telling to illustrate some points, Abraham trots out Moses and the prophets, but for a different purpose. Why would you say he brings up Moses and the prophets? What was Moses to the Jews? A deliverer. A deliverer who physically delivered them out of bondage, out of the bondage of the Egyptians. From him they got the law, which they said is eternal, because God is eternal and is in special reference to their ceremonial laws and the civil law that guided Israel as a nation and kept it separate from the other peoples. So this gives them their nation out of Moses. They felt they got out of Moses their nation and the laws that governed their nation and their worship and they did for a while, but it wasn't meant to just stay that way. It was meant, as we hear in Galatians, for Israel to be a light to the nations, and the Gentiles were included in the promise to Abraham, but they conveniently forget that. <clears throat> um, and so... The last two scriptures, John 5, 39, we'll go back there. Jesus continuing to deal with this issue of authority of the Son and the importance of his word abiding in them, who truly is their father. And in verse 38 of John, again, I'm sure words familiar to you, <clears throat> Go back to verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. How did he do that? Do you recall in Jesus' life? How the baptism? Yes, it is baptism and transfiguration at other places. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Listen to him. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures, and this is what the Judaizers were doing in Paul's time in Galatia, and they were doing in Jesus' time now, and throughout all time. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You see, because God gave them to Moses and because God gave them the scriptures as well, the, what they considered the scriptures at that time, the, the law and, and the Torah, and, you know, Exodus and all of that, the worship, that they are eternal because God is eternal. You think in them, you have, therefore if they have them, even if they don't obey them, they have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me, that you may not 
have life. And verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, if you really believed, he's saying what Moses wrote about, what Moses said, what Moses did. If you believed Moses, you would believe in me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? <clears throat> and so I guess my point is that as we go back to Galatians and we took this little spin around scriptures. We did what we trotted out. We trotted around the scriptures. Hopefully we uh, didn't gallop around too fast. But um, perhaps it will give you a, a better understanding of why Moses was so important, why Abraham was so important, that this is a, not a new struggle. This is what they always did. This is what they do now. They will bring these things out. Abraham, Moses, Moses, Abraham, the patriarchs, the law, circumcision, dietary laws, all of these other things. Because they believed that the Jews were to be separate always from the Gentiles. The, that the Gentiles were lesser and they were not heirs of the promise because they did not descend from Abraham. And they did not have the law and the, and the, and the, the um, temple and all these other things. So that idea was to keep people separated. And in, in Galatians, we see at the last portion of the third chapter in verse 26 and following... For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then he comes back full circle again, and he says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise. So he's going to keep hammering that it's the spiritual descendants of Abraham who believed as Abraham believed the word of God who are the true sons of God. And I just want to say that the thought in that verse 28 is not that there are no distinctions anymore, that distinctions among peoples have ceased, but the issue is that in Christ, they don't matter. They don't matter as to keep one separated from the other. They don't matter in the sense that, that women are less than men or that slaves are less uh, entitled to salvation. I don't want to use entitled, but uh, um, recipients of salvation um, more than free men are or less than free men. Um, but you're all one in Christ. The, the ground is level at the cross. It was never level in Judaism. And because in the other portions of Scripture, you know, there are still roles and there are still, there is still um, um, a structure that God puts in place in the church and in the social relationships and so on. But in Christ, doesn't matter. One is not better than the other. We're all at the foot of the cross. And so then I'm looking forward to getting into to chapter 4 because it will talk and take the themes of sons of gods and heirs and, and all these things that they will, they will have some grasp of, but not according to, to Scripture, um, about who are the true sons of God and what does it mean to be an adopted child of God. We are adoption. So, uh, three lessons. Know your scripture. Get the full breadth of scripture. That's why in this study we try to teach the whole counsel of God over the years as best we can. 
remember your history, not only our church history, but our spiritual history in Christ, what he has done for us. And as Peter said at the end of his life, the last few words that he gave before he was martyred, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you have any questions or thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know if you answer this today or maybe another time, but um, a, lot, a lot of us listen to Moody Radio, and it's particularly leading up to Easter and Passover. They talk about uh, to the Jew first, and I know um, the chosen people in a lot of... Um, churches with the modern day Israel, all that, and the, um, all their um, messianic churches, uh, whatever they are called, uh, is geared toward evangelism to the Jew first, and what that means to the Jew first and to the Gentiles, just some um, background or what that may mean uh, to us as covenant believers, is that different to what it means to them, or just address that issue? Not, and I say you look yeah. into it a little bit, not necessarily today, it's um, just a question. Quick I answer, Romans 1, <clears throat> verses 16 and following. The historic mandate in God's economy of salvation. <clears throat> Paul says here, and it's said other, in other places, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or Gentile, and so on. So in God's economy, because he had gathered together the Jews first, the gospel was to go to them first and then through them to the Gentiles. I don't know that it holds um, perpetual meaning in terms of how we do our evangelism, that we have to go to the Jews first. Because, but they were given the privilege of, of um, hearing it first. They had blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing the covenants and the oracles and, and the prophets, and they had all of these indicators that should have equipped them to believe. Um, and so when they rejected it, Paul says, I, I, you know, it's mandated to go to the Jews first, I mm -hmm. leave you and I go to the Gentiles. So I think it was a, it, it is just an overall statement of, of how the gospel um, was first declared um, as God formed this nation, Israel, first and so on. Does that make sense? Yes, but is an application for us today. I don't know they that. They seem to mention that we should really have a priority of um, um, Well, you know why I think that Jews. is? I and think, I, you know, in our neighborhood is Spanish. We take Spanish. I mean, everybody's yeah. reaching out. I, I think, Jan, if you dig into that a little bit, and as you listen to certain ones, you're going to find that, that many of them are dispensationalists. Yeah, and so they believe that God had two plans, right. and he had two groups. And the first are the Jews, yeah. and um, the second are whatever's left. And so I would think that they might be coming, and I don't agree with it, but I think that they might be coming from a perspective of still of that, you know, that Schofield Bible direction that it, the Jews are still the most important ones because they're going to have the earthly kingdom and the renewing of the temple. And so you've got to get to the Jews. You've got to get the Jews. You've got to get the Jews. And I think it's a misunderstanding of, of redemptive history. I think you might find that that's behind a great that's, deal of that. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we should ne neglect any person, oh, Jew or Gentile, nor should we be afraid of Jews, because. but you're, you're being equipped to understand a little more about how maybe to approach them and so on. Um, and, and they're still dear. Faith. They're dear in God's eyes, of course, but, but um, I would bet that behind that is a dispensational theology and not a covenant theology, you know, of looking at the scriptures especially as we as they look to the end times and some of the premillennial and, and uh, um, different ideas of you know that there are two two groups of people and they stay distinguished throughout all history and on into eternity the Jews and um, the church or the Gentiles but don't you think that they believe the Jews believe that they are the chosen people mm -hmm. yeah right? sure mm -hmm. and yeah. because of that then they take priority the God will will go to them first, and you Gentiles, you get the breadcrumbs. 
True, so yeah. Right. But I think behind that too is that is a lot of these people that talk on the radios are looking to fulfilling an end time prophecies as they understand it, which is a kingdom of the Jews, you know, back in the kingdom, you know, having a kingdom of their own and having the temple restructured and going back to the sacrifices and all of this other stuff. And so it's imperative that the Jews be brought in. Um, and the Jews have, most of them have misunderstood the whole revelation of, of God. Anyone else? Yes. And the Jews, they don't have no other choice but to believe what they have. Oh, they have every choice. Right. <laughs> every choice. But they, they just reject it. Yeah. They just reject it because they can't imagine in their wicked hearts yeah. that, that, that God would ever include the Gentiles. And this is what we're seeing in Galatians. It cannot be unless you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses. How can you be right with God? How can you enter into Abraham's bosom? How can you receive the blessings of Abraham that he talked about? which they consider to be not so much spiritual blessings, but land and progeny and, and all these other things. The Hebrews 11, which I mentioned last yes. week, is where Abraham looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So he was looking forward to that eternal. Eternal city. city. And there will be a new heaven and a new yeah. earth in which dwells righteousness. Heaven is not our final destination. Yeah, somehow there's a new heavens and a new earth. And all things brought and restored in Christ. The angels in their abode and will be uh, in some way able to, that we'll all be in one kind of abode somehow. Uh, I don't know how it will work out, but it's certainly exciting. Okay. I guess we're at table work. Thank you. It's good to be with you.